Let me get my mic on and get the screen share up. And well, I guess we've had the presentation already. <laughs> no, I'm I can't. Can Doesn't I not be heard? Uh, it's, it's coming up here. Just hold on. Okay, there you should see it now. Everybody been able to see it? Yes. Good. Okay. So tonight I was going to talk about something that's a little bit off topic. That's not absolutely directly related to him, but it kind of skirts around some uh, some interesting concepts out there that we may end up uh, getting involved a lot about. It. So we're going to talk about the, uh, the subject is Laura. And uh, it's some new technology out there. Actually, it's been around for a little bit, for a little while, but it's actually going to be, it's picking up more and more steam. And we're going to be seeing more Laura, more about Laura that's coming up in the future. And also there's other, several other technologies that Laura actually touches on that we probably want to know about. So one of the technologies that we're going to be talking about is IoT, and that stands for Internet of Things. I think everybody knows what Internet is, but things are kind of a, a squishy, squishy subject, and we will end up talking about what the things are, and we'll talk a little bit about how Laura fits into IoT. So to start off with, let's talk about Laura. Laura stands for long range mm. an inter international standard and it was developed for using really low power rf for really long range using digital communications uh, so the secret sauce of this is a modulation technology that is based on sp spread spectrum and it's kind of interesting on how they do it. Uh, it depending on the speed of the data that is transmitting back and forth, uh, depends on how much our effort puts out there in that spread, spread, spread spectrum area. So I'm not going to get into the whole details of that, but it's kind of in there. It's an interesting to read to see how this stuff actually works. So here's um, an actually a footprint of a LoRa transceiver. This is a transmitter and receiver. There's a chip here in the middle and there's a company out there that is, uh, this is a little bit proprietary, but they make this chip and it does all the uh, serialization of the data, does all the demodulation and figures out how to spread that uh, RF around to uh, make it visible by the receiver at the other end. All of these Surface mounted components, uh, resistors, capacitors, inductors, that's all the transmitter. So that's all the uh, filters uh, for both the receive and the RF deck for the transmit. This little guy over here on the left side here, that's the crystal oscillator. Now this is not a temperature controlled crystal oscillator. This device here in the US runs at about 900 megahertz. So um, uh, it's not an absolutely perfectly stable crystal oscillator. And some, there's some really neat features that are built into this guy that, are how, that allows you to take and track the RF transmission on the receive so you can take and receive it properly. Pretty, there, there's just a ton of state-of-the-art stuff that's packed into this chip on how it works. So let's look at the uh, kind of some of the big overall specs. So in the US, this device works in the 900 megahertz spectrum. It works from 915 to 928 megahertz. It's a channelized, so there's 64 base channels, and then there's a handful of other specialty channels that actually gets you up to about 72 separate channels, just like Wi Fi. Uh, this guy is channelized, but means that it can go a long range a lot further than Wi-Fi, 
there's a lot more channels in there that uh, that it can handle. Different channels will have different bandwidths. Some of them, uh, the bandwidths are 120 uh, kilohertz, some are 250 and some are 500. As you get into the wider bandwidth, those are the guys that uh, have more dominance and generally those are the guys that can carry longer in distance. Transmit power. So this is where things start getting kind of interesting. Transmit power really between 10 to 25 milliwatts, milliwatts. So that's 0 0.025 watts. So that's chicken feed as far as um, RF that it's actually putting out there. So it has a variable data rate by anywhere from 0.3 kilo, uh, kilobits per second to 27 kilobits per second. It actually gets can get all the way up to about 30 Four, I don't know, 34, 37 kilobits, but those aren't too used very often because uh, at that speed, the distance that uh, it will travel is somewhat limited. So this has a packet size of 24 bytes per packet. So that means you can load this thing up with up to 24 bytes and it will squirt those packets out. And if you need to send a, uh, a data um, a piece of data that's more than 25, you're going to have to have multiples of 24 uh, bytes of packet to end up sending it out there. No big deal. So the data rate is affected by distance, or I should say the distance is affected by the data rate. The faster it goes, the less distance it goes. The slower it goes, the more distance you get. So let's talk about how far this st stuff goes. So out of that measly 25 milliwatts, you can get pretty easily somewhere between six to 12 miles. Six to 12 miles out of 25 milliwatts. Try getting something like that on your HT that's running five watts to eight watts. Not likely. If you end up souping up the antennas with some good directional stuff, you can get about 45 miles uh, out of it with a decent antennas. And you can actually get even further than that. Pretty, pretty uh, interesting to see how, how far it uh, will go with some really good antennas. So let's kind of compare this guy to some other well-known short range RF uh, paradigms. So Laura, 25 milliwatts transmit, we can get somewhere between 300 bits per second up to a max of around 37 kilobits per second, somewhere around six to 12 miles. Packet size is limited to 64 bytes, but that's, that's not really a horrible limitation there. Let's talk about Bluetooth. Bluetooth are those little earbuds that you usually stick in your ear that connects up to your little cell phone. Those, that runs about 25 milliwatts, but that has a data rate around 624 to 527 kilobits per second. So that has, there you can carry voice, you can carry music, you can carry tunes, you can carry a lot of data. But being said, you're only producing about 25 milliwatts, it's not gonna carry very far, very far. So out of Bluetooth, you're lucky to get um, about 30 feet worth of coverage there. Enough, enough coverage there to cover a good size room pretty small. So let's talk about our good old friend Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is limited by the FCC for uh, 100 milliwatts. It can cover, produce about uh, two to 150 megabits per second. So there you can actually move data, you can move large chunks of, of information. But again, being that you're only running about 25 milliwatts and you have a really large budget for moving a lot of data, that is only gonna cover about 160 feet. So that's gonna cover a good size house. So with one Wi-Fi unit, you're gonna be able to cover a good, good house and have, be able to produce some decent data around. There's a new guy in town that you probably haven't heard of, and that's so-called Sigfox. So this is a direct competition with Laura. He can get up to 150 milliwatts, 
but his data rate is only between 100 to 600 bits per second. Really, really slow bit rate. But he has a coverage of somewhere between 6 to 24 miles. So he can get almost twice the coverage out of it. But the killer is, is that his packet load, he can only transmit and receive 12 bytes per packet. Really, really small data load on that. So that's kind of a limiting factor on that. You have to be really smart and really careful on how much data that you end up sending out on one of these guys. There's uh, another family of low power 900 megahertz boards out there. They normally run about four uh, milliwatts. You can do about 20 kilobits per second. But those dudes there are only good for about five to 10 feet. So they can get you from one end of your desk to the other end of your desk. Um, and that's about the limit to it. Very, very limited for those kinds of devices. So here's a nice little chart that kind of shows where Aurora fits in with uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. It also gives you some perspective of cellular service. Cellular service um, will cover very limited to about, um, about 17 miles. It's about the best that you're going to get out of cellular. You can get more out of it, you know, so you can get less out of it, but it depends on the environment. But again, you look over on the left side, that's bandwidth. That's how much data you're sending out. The bottom of this is the range that you're going to be able to send out. You can see Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. That's pretty high bandwidth, but relatively short range. Sailor, that's high bandwidth and pretty decent range. Now, Aurora is really low bandwidth, but really awesome range. So that's kind of how it fits into that. Uh, all those little low power uh, transceivers that we have uh, in our environment. So in Europe, LoRa and IoT is a really big thing, really big thing. They pioneered this, um, been a lot of pioneering in this whole area. So the guys that invented Laura were two sci French scientists. They're the ones that came up with the concept of Laura. And then there is another company in Taiwan that actually actually built a chipset that uh, embraces the Laura, all the Laura functionality. So here, a couple guys took a balloon, put a Laura transceiver up in it, and I don't, I looked and looked, but they never identified the altitude. But I know that in Europe, you cannot put balloons up really, really high without getting the federal or the um, guys that manage all the aviation around there. Well, they have to know about that. So these guys have to stay at a relatively low level, probably a couple thousand feet, the best they're going to be able to operate this at. But in uh, the 16th of April, 2020, they set a brand new record of 517 miles out of using a transceiver that operated on 25 milliwatts. That's pretty darn awesome. And it's not uncommon, these guys working with cell towers that have LoRa nodes on it, LoRa WANs on it, they're able to get you know, eight, 70 to 90 kilometers out of those things. Pretty in, in, impressive the amount of distance you can get out of uh, the LoRa product. So let's talk about a LoRa node. LoRa node, what you know, I kind of made my case here. Here we have a really cool transmitter, receiver, or transceiver that works on extremely low power, has a really, really low budget for needing power and what the heck do we do with it? So these, what we kind of use these guys for is that we usually connect a little tiny processor with it that actually has some sensors for like temperature, humidity, uh, moisture in ground. Uh, you can also operate actuators or switches so you can turn different things on with that. So a lower node is usually a device with a processor with some sensors, 
for data actuators on it for turning things on and off. And then there's a control that RF link is used for either passing on the data sensor information or for actuating sensors for turning things on and off. So here's a typical uh, LoRa node. I don't remember, this is some kind of a distance sensing thing and I don't remember exactly what it's used, but it's in a nice waterproof case. Um, this is the antenna, the 900 megahertz antenna. And so this guy here is all put together where it can handle the weather. So you can screw it in. It can, with this sensing device, I guess determine if this gate opens or the gate closes and pass that information to the RF link back into some other system. And we're gonna get into what, a, what that other system is pretty quickly here. So what happens with the data that a LoRa node collects? So there's two different paradigms out here. One of them is this data can be controlled and go into our private network, or this data can be controlled or go into a public network or thereby the internet. I'll put together an example here. Let's say that you're down in California you have a thousand acres of almonds. You have this huge, massive almond grove. You have this hillside that faces south that has all these almonds on. You have sensors across that, um, across that whole grove there that tells you what the moisture is in the ground. So that's being, all that information is, gets reported back to an application and you can look at this information in real time on your little tablet. So you're sitting at your kitchen table, drinking a little bit of wine there and you're looking through all these little sensors out there and you see this hillside that's facing south that is drying out. You need to get some water. So from that little tablet, you have the ability to turn on water turn on a drip system that feeds water to all your little almond trees out there. So this system here is a private system. All that information stays within a private network inside a LAN, a local area network. So there you have some kind of a, um, a gateway that collects that information. You probably have some kind of a uh, minor application there that runs on maybe a, a a PC that ends up is able to collect it and display that information for you. Let's say you're going to run that into a public network, into the internet. So here's a little bit different picture for you to get your head around. So let's say that you're, you have a big thousand acres of the ones there in California. You have about, uh, 30 hectares of almonds in the southern part of Spain. You have another um, 300 hectares over in Greece of almonds. And you're setting down on a small island off the tip of, uh, of um, Italy there called Malta. And you're sitting there having your dinner there and you're drinking your red wine there. You have your little tablet out. And now you can get on the internet and you can look at all these sensors from all your different rows, from all your different areas. And you see that here again, down in California, your south facing uh, hillside is starting to dry out. And from your little tablet there through, via the internet, you can turn all of that, turn on the water system there to provide nourishment for your almond trees. So this information here is going into the internet. There are hosting companies out there, just like internet providers that specialize in supporting for internet of things or LoRa nodes. So they will host databases. They will host their applications for collecting and viewing all of this information. Kind of get the big picture between, you know, private networks and internet uh, networks where you know, private is just local. Internet is if you want to end up within that, uh, you know, more global view. 
So here's a nice picture here. Here on the left side here, you can see your almond, your almond trees out there. You have a gateway, which is a little device that picks up all the RF and drops it into TCP IP packets and is able to update the servers that is uh, on the internet. And then you have some public access that you have applications that you can then look at this data. So this is known as a LoRa gateway. LoRa gateway is this device here. Basically takes the RF, converts it into, <clears throat> into IP type of packets. So one term that you'll get accustomed to seeing if you're looking at these kinds of products, that's called LoRaWAN. That's a long range wide area network. These devices can be up on towers. Portland has 11 towers that has actually LoRaWANs on there. They have gateways up there. So people, can let's say you have a delivery system that is run off of bicycles. So you can keep track of uh, like a LoRa node and see, you know, via GPS. He's just reporting the GPS position where he is. So you can see where in the city that bicycle is or that automobile is on where he is on doing his deliveries. There are none down here in the valley. Um, there's two out on the coast, and I don't remember where else on the state, but Portland is the main place. So think about this. This is just a regular old cell tower up there, and some ISP wants to end up hosting some uh, LoRa stuff on it. They pay for putting up a, a LoRa gateway. All it is is just a black box. They just tie into the tower. They may put up a little special antenna, run a Cat5 cable up, up to it, and run power over Ethernet, and bingo, you've got a gateway up on top of a, a tower. So that information gets dumped in the internet. And then you have service providers out there, and in the US, there's about five service providers, just like an ISP. And we'll get to what those guys, how they fit in. So you can also, like down here, if we want to get it into the internet, we can buy a little box here, a little white box there that's in the middle. That's a home gateway for LoRa. So we can take our local sensors that's around our house or around our property and have a way of putting that into the internet so then we can actually get our hands on it. There's two satellites that have LoRa support on it. And so there's four passes daily. You have to know what time they're coming by that you can actually post your stuff to the gateway. There's service costs to do things via satellite. So internet of things, new term. You probably heard this term, but maybe not entirely understand with it. So everybody understands the first part, internet. You know what that is. What the heck is things, T-H-I-N-G-S? What does that mean? Things that are embedded with sensors, software, other technology for the purpose of connecting and exchanging data for other devices over the internet. So that's a definition of what IOT stands for. So what this is really saying is that you have all these sensors they may be private sensors, they may be public sensors, but all of these, this information is being pushed up into the internet and then you have service providers out there that allows you to end up connecting to them. Let's say you have a statewide weather system. Think about the old days about the state needed to put together a weather system so they could see what the weather looks like up in, um, in Portland, what it looks like in Medford, what it looks like in Bend, what it looks like in Burns, all across the state. You got 200 nodes out there. Can you imagine building a private network for moving all of that data? The cost of maintaining it, the cost of building it would be staggering. 
So with IoT, all you really need is um, a cell phone connection or another any way of collecting this information and getting it into um, an, into an IP address and into the internet. So there's a cell phone tower. That's a bridge to get it in there. So here, 200 stations. It's a piece of cake. All you're really doing is paying for the cost of hosting this this stuff, and it's all easily gotten a hold of, and you don't have to maintain the system. So when you see IoT, it's a collection of a lot of sensors and a lot of actuators that could be private, it could be open source, so anybody could look at that. So here's another example of it. These Here's um, a bunch of LoRa nodes out here. We're collecting something. And actually, these, I'm not sure what these have on them. <laughs> they send things wireless to a wireless, uh, to a LoRa WAN, the gateway, changes it into an IP packet, shoves it into the internet. And the Things Network, that's just another hosting. Um, company out there that hosts these, uh, these types of things. They provide storage or ability for application for hosting applications and all kinds of other different really cool things. So let's see what what happens when you want to host something. So I mentioned there's like five different for the US there's about five different providers. So the first thing that you end up doing is creating an account. You register your gateway if you're using a gateway or if it's going through a public gateway to identify who that gateway is or what it is. Then you go through there and register your nodes. So now you have a note, your nodes going through a particular gateway that is associated with your account. With this account, you can make it a public account, you can make it a private account. There's all kinds of different kinds of accounts. But Normally at this point in time, there is a cost to it. So you're gonna end up having to pony up a little bit of money for, for this. If you're doing it just as a consumer, it's very nominal. If you're doing it as a commercial and industrial environment, it's more expensive. And usually the cost uh, is by per, per node. If you've just got a couple of nodes, it's no big deal, but if you're trying to register a couple hundred nodes, it gets pretty, gets more expensive. So the other part that I mentioned, rules, applications, you need to be able to see what you have. So these uh, companies out there also have an extensive set of tools for building your application. Uh, granted, these aren't real sophisticated applications. These are pretty basic switchboard type applications. They're pretty simple, but there are tools to at least get you going there so you can see what's going on. Another cool thing, I think everybody knows what MASH means. Uh, that's ability to be able to network a bunch of uh, nodes out there, RF nodes, and make things to a point where they're redundant. So if one node fails, another node picks up, picks up the routing and passes the information through the system. So yes, uh, in LoRa, there are applications that are put together that can provide you this kind of redundancy out there. Uh, so let's talk about kinds of applications. So weather stations. I actually, here at my house, I actually built a weather station uh, out of LoRa nodes and little Arduino processors. So I have a little device out in my pasture that runs off a solar panel that takes care of humidity, uh, temperature, uh, wind velocity, rain, uh, uh, direction of the, the wind. So it collects all that information and then passes it through a little, through a, nor, through a LoRa a device and passes it up to the house here. And I have a little a device up here that collects temperatures the same method for what's going on in the house, what's going out on the porch, and I don't remember a few other odds and ends, but all of that gets collected, gets dumped into a little database and I have a little application 
that uh, puts all the stuff on the web for me that I can take a look at and see what it looks like um, through, through a, a web browser. Pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> so kinds of automations. So I'm thinking about this more as a consumer. So you can control lights in your house. You can control locks. So think about this. You could do this um, uh, if someone needs to get into your house, someone if your son needs to get in there. You can take and unlock doors. You can let the person in. If you know that you're going to be coming home and you want to take a look at the temp temperature, you, there are you can have controls that connects into your uh, HVAC system to be able to turn it on and cool things down. Sprinkler systems. Um, you can run your sprinkler system with it rather than having to have a bunch of wires that run out to all your control valves. You can do this all via more. Uh, there's a real cute, let's see, is that? I don't remember if it was uh, on a ham radio thing or where, but. There's a real cute little um, do-it-yourself project for a mailbox. You know, my mailbox is a thousand feet away from it, so I really don't want to waste my time having to walk all the way down to the end of the driveway to see if the mailman's dropped something in there. So I've been wanting to do it and haven't done it, but you can put a little alarm that says, okay, there's mail in the mailbox, and I can go down and pick stuff up and not have to worry about it. Motion detectors. You can uh, again, my uh, house is uh, I've got a thousand feet of driveway, so I can put a motion detector down into the, the driveway and tell that someone's coming up the driveway uh, pretty easily on that. Uh, rain, there's tons of smart devices out there, more and more smart devices, wireless devices that are coming online, both for security and also managing and controlling your house. And I'm seeing more and more Laura actually go into that as far as doing that type of control. There's wearables out there. So as you're walking or jogging, um, you can get reports on your heartbeat, blood pressure, uh, if your heart's pumping at all. There's some new stuff coming online uh, for elder care, where people can get hooked up in an old folks town, uh, uh, old folks community, and you can tell where they are via GPS. You can tell if they're upright, laying down, if they've assumed room temperature, or if their heart is still beating. Uh, so you can track what's going on. Tracking objects, like in a large um, location that's uh, where they're, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're moving these great big containers around. You can use them for tracking containers to see where they are and where you need to move them next. There's a huge amount of stuff going on with manufacturing and agriculture and marine is starting to come online as far as reporting uh, what's going on offshore as far as uh, wind gust, uh, wave action, uh, water temperature, um, what's going on with um, dissolved oxygen. So a lot of that is being uh, reported via LoRa. It's a real cheap way of not having to use satellites, but able to get it on land uh, as long as you're not feeling the horizon effect there. So you're probably limited to about uh, 15, 16 miles off offshore. Uh, but anyway, you kind of get the idea as far as manufacturing and agriculture. Agriculture is really doing, doing a lot of LoRa type of stuff at this time. So let's think about hams. Pasta tables. Pasta tables is getting more and more expensive. Expensive, that cost of copper is just getting so bloody expensive these more. So it's really nice to think about ways of replacing uh, copper uh, and not have to take and run that. So a couple of things is like you can control your ham shack. So it's kind of nice if you have a tube amp or a bunch of tube stuff up there where remotely you can, uh, with your cell phone, take and power up your ham shack and have everything all warmed up when you get up to it in the morning. OAX switches. 
Now, where do you want to put your coax switch? You want to put it up on the top of the antenna where you have the least amount of, or where you have all your uh, coax come together in one place and it comes into a coax switch and you only have one, um, one piece of coax that comes out of it, it comes back to the uh, ham shack. Saves a lot of cost on expensive coax. So there, you, you know, if you put in like LMR 600, that is bloody expensive, right? but it has practically no loss to it, that would be a good application. So there, you would use a LORA, LORA system there for your RF, little control unit down in your ham shack. And up on top of your antenna, you have a little uh, 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 photo, photo cell up there to pick up the, um, the sun there, solar panel. To run the thing. Here's an interesting one, a uh, remote control of a rotator. So I actually did a proof of concept. So via an RF link, I was able to control forward and reverse and direction um, and do that via a LoRa device. And it actually worked and the delay and stuff like that just wasn't too bad. It actually worked quite nicely. I actually moved more of the smarts up to the um, rotor controller that was up next to the uh, rotor. So it kept track of where it was and did all the, yeah, I just sent it a direction of where to go and then it took care of uh, uh, managing how to control that actual uh, uh, rotator. Worked very nicely. So if you're a sophisticated um, uh, ham, uh, I see for more and more guys are putting LNAs, that's a low noise amplifier. They're actually putting those out at the antenna. And so like LNAs, you can have want the ability to turn it on and you also want the ability to adjust the gain. So a LoRa transceiver would be an ideal solution for managing that device out on your antenna. So where's the best place to put your antenna tuner? And typically, where the best place is to put it is right at the feed point, right at your antenna. So again, using LoRa to take and actually control the antenna tune cycle and see if it worked out correctly uh, for an automatic antenna tuner or if you're doing it manual, it's a little different problem. But again, more good, good way of solving that problem. Um, so again, where's the best place? If you wanted to uh, look at the actual uh, output power and your SWR, the best place to sample that, again, is at the feed point. You don't want to sample it back at the antenna shack because there it's um, your your coax is going to end up uh, changing the value that you're actually looking for. So if you have an SWR bridge or um, a power bridge at your feed point, you can do all that sampling and report it back um, via war. Good, good, uh, good place to use that. So here's another one that um, I don't know if I talked about that, but we have, where I live out here in Silk Creek, uh, up on top of Coffin View, we have a little uh, repeater up there, a little simplex repeater that looks down in our valley here and provides us communication uh, for in case of an emergency. So we just got finished instrumenting that to be able to monitor the uh, solar vo voltage, look at how much power was going into the battery, coming out of it, we have um, RF monitors who look at um, our two meter transceiver to see how much RF was going out and see what the SWR is and uh, some other controls in there. But again, what we did was use LoRa to, and a little processor to collect all that information and use LoRa to transmit it. And there's three of us that are kind of net controls that have little LoRa receivers and we can receive that information and look at it and see if we have a problem and see if um, our SWR has gone bonkers. So something's damaged the uh, antenna or feed system 
and you can see that our batteries are being charged properly and not overcharged. So that was another really good use of water. That works incredibly good. That network there travels um, five miles and two of us are behind a whole lot of trees and that LoRa signal does manage to get through those, uh, those trees. So if you are a do-it-yourself or a hobbyist and like building little projects out on the internet, if you want to do some kind of a wireless system, there's tons and tons of information on hardware, software, software, and lots of helpful blogs to help solve problems on this particular subject. So it's, it's a really cool do-it-yourself um, type of uh, system if you like doing it. So let's wrap things up here. So um, LoRa is a low power, long range transceiver platform. It's rapidly becoming the de facto wireless uh, platform for Internet of Things, Inter for Internet of Things, for taking all those um, uh, sensors and actuators um, and think of it like a big factory rather than having to run wire all over a factory. You could build a LoRa network that's also a mesh network. Uh, and properly designed, hugely cuts down on the cost of, of wires or um, fiber optics and stuff for running a very large uh, manufacturing facility that's over multiple acres. So lower nodes are used for collecting uh, sensor data and also for controlling switches or actuators out there. LoRa is a low power, long range wireless transceiver platform. Oh, excuse me, this seems to work, should it? That, this is the right one. Or provides uh, connectivity into the internet. Can also be used as for a private network. There are many tools available for creating applications. So if you wanna build your own little application, you can find tools out there to do that. Uh, but again, those are going to be pretty primitive. They're going to be kind of like um, switchboards. Um, won't be a custom application, but it's more than enough to get the job done. If you like do-it-yourself hardware, software, uh, LoRa is a fun place to, uh, to go to, uh, especially using the Arduino platform for the processor and software support. Tons of stuff out there for you. As this platform matures, you will find it in many consumer devices using LoRa at IoT. So as we continue um, into the future, and part of what I put this together for is to give people some ideals of things that are coming along in the future that uh, when we see the LoRa emblem or IoT on it, we will get some ideal on what kind of capability this particular device has. So, uh, so look for those, those kinds of emblems there in the future. So anyway, that is it. Um, so if you got any questions, I'll throw them at me or let me know what you, what you think. How do so you share frequencies? So say, how, what was that again on frequencies? How do you share the frequencies? Okay. Um, generally, you can, you can just turn your receiver on, see if anybody's using that frequency. If anybody's using that channel, you just move on to another. Um, being a spread, spread spectrum, um, you can actually share those uh, frequencies pretty decently and not run into uh, really too much of a problem. So um, there is no one place you go for compliance on who uses what frequency. It's kind of like you grab what, whatever looks the best. You can usually find on lower, uh, on gateways, like if you're up in Portland, uh, there's probably some websites that you could probably look at that gives you some idea of what channels actually end up getting used there. I wonder if there's anything like a CSMA, just listening for a moment and then transmitting. Yeah, 
Uh, well, there isn't any real pinging that goes on. Uh, the protocol really doesn't have that concept in it, but it's pretty easy if when you just put it in promiscuous road mode, uh, you can see something that comes across it. It may be encrypted. Um, it may not be encrypted. Actually, that's another thing I didn't really talk about was security. On the wireless side of that, you're, you're, if you want encryption, you have to do it yourself. So there's nothing that's built in. But once it gets into a gateway, then you have all the encryption that's normally applied for any kind of internet or any kind of internet encryption. Any other comments or thoughts? So I first got introduced to this through an article I read, um, like I was testing it out uh, just from the, you know, the tech standpoint. And uh, so he was, uh, first comment was, you know, their, the, the setup he was testing was, uh, did up to 300 bits per second. So he's like, it's not a whole lot, but you know, it's a neat little thing. Yep. So then he ended up, uh, he had a, uh, a location that he had uh, done some tech stuff or some IT stuff for. Uh, and he first got introduced to the site because uh, the HVAC system had uh, recently been upgraded and it was a somewhat complicated building complex where the HVAC units were located in the basement of one building and the control systems for the said HVAC were located in a different building in a different basement. So they're about 10 feet or so below ground and about hundred feet apart. Mm -hmm. uh, and he originally went out because they, their, the HVAC people kept complaining about his networking firewall blocking the traffic on the network. And he's like, you don't know how to network. Um, when he did eventually make it on site, um, he found uh, there, there's standards for how you wire a, uh, a cat five, uh, RJ 45 cable. Um, yeah. the, the tech did not follow any standards, uh, and the cable failed the check horribly. Uh, but, uh, he's like, so in his first call out, he goes and actually fixes the, the cable. And, uh, that was that, but he's like, I wonder, did they even have to run this cable? Cause it run like the control link is only only needs a few you know tens of bits per second uh every infrequently so he actually took the the laura setup and uh set one in the one basement with the control unit one in the other basement with the, next to the the hvac and he's like so here's the thing like you can't in this basement you can barely get the wi-fi from the room above let alone a Wi-Fi signal from the next basement over. And he had full throughput between the two locations on the LoRa, uh, hmm. 10 feet underground, 100 feet apart. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Yeah, so here's, here's um, this guy here is a breadboarded LoRa. Uh, let's see if I can get, yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay, that's crisp. <laughs> So basically this has a little teensy processor here. This is the LoRa chip itself. And then of course the nine megahertz antenna. So normally there would be off the teensy here, the processor, there'd be some other sensors like for humidity or temperature or, or whatever you're trying to me measure this. So this is just a breadboard version of some of the stuff I've done. This is actually this here is uh, my LoRa WAN. So you can see my ethernet cable here that's, that's coming out of the back end of it. And all this is, is again, a little teensy um, um, off the shelf board, a networking or an ethernet board and a LoRa board on the very top. So this is all elf off the shelf stuff that I just bought, stacked it together, took some software, threw it together, and the only thing I really dealt with was the pr protocol that I wanted to work with. Every all the other software just it's it's a regular Arduino type of project. So pretty pretty cool. 
But yeah, uh, Anthony, that's it's it is it is kind of um, very surprising what that darn Laura gets through, and it gets through it with the greatest of ease. And the nice thing is that you have that chip is very robust. The software is very robust, where it tells you your signal to noise. One of the things I find is that if I set my gateway over here next to my computer, my signal to noise goes way down uh, because it's it's I have all the hash electronics coming out of the from uh, my my workstation and server. But if I move it away, my signal to noise goes way up. And then um, then it also tells you your RSSI. Space. Basically, that's your signal strength in dB. It actually tells you in dB what the signal strength is. So you have a very clear understanding about how strong that signal is. So you know when you're putting things in a bad place or putting things in a good place. Uh, it's also, I have another one in a, another device in the other room here. I should have brought <clears> it in. But it actually has a little dipole that I built on it. So if you turn things over horizontally and use a dipole, there you have much better range. You don't have omnidirectional RF going every directional. You have RF going in a directional manner, and it really super improves the um, uh, receivability and transmittability of the, of the data. But HVAC system, perfect solution for that. Um, one of, like if you have windows that I we have really tall windows, and I have a, a little device up there that. Uh, in our house that actually during the summer, I can open the windows and dump a huge amount of heat that collects up, up high on the uh, upper story there. And so I've done that with Wi-Fi. Uh, probably sometime this summer, this next winter, I'll probably convert that over to a LoRa system to be able to do, do all of that. So I have two applications. Um, Sorry, were you finished? Yeah. Okay, sorry. It sounded like a place to jump in. Um, I'm involved for a way to move images around. You know, you can talk on the repeater all day, but if you'd like to take a picture of something going on, a road blockage or something, and I quickly concluded, I did a little bit of looking into Laura. Um, it, it wasn't going to have the bandwidth to move photos around. No. Nope. Um, but I have to say, I did learn a lot tonight. You went into it way more detail than I did. Um, but my second application is you are talking. Um, my sister and brother-in-law, actually brother-in-law's family, own land uh, up above La Grande. And they occasionally have trouble with uh, uh, people breaking in, you know, breaking the locks and going up. And I thought, I, I was thinking of some way to provide, you know, just a signal of gate open, closed, uh, traffic on the road into their place and, and with two sensors so you could see whether the traffic's going in or out and then maybe you know uh, they've got a solar system up there what the solar system's doing that sort of thing and uh, brother-in-law and sister live probably about 10 miles from the place and uh, brother-in-law's sister is even closer and I was thinking bingo <laughs> it sounds perfect yep yep so yeah, something like that, you could um, take a look at. And, and you don't have to send that data all the time. I mean, it's like once every half an hour or once every 15 minutes, if you can skate it, make it longer, you don't need as much power. One of the guys that I know has a project that he did where the processor on the little adrenal platform, you can put those processors to sleep and they don't draw hardly anything. So he has a little moisture sensor out in his garden that he measures both the moisture and the temperature of the soil. And about twice a day, that thing wakes up, transmits it back to his office there and he has a nine volt battery that he runs it on and he swears that he can get almost a year worth of use out of that nine volt battery. Yeah, the other way would be just to send uh, the signal when, when an event happens like the gate opening and 
either wait for an acknowledge or send it three times and assume it's going to get through one of the three. Yep. And yeah, there's different ways to play the game. Right. Yeah, it's just, it depends on what your power budget is. You have to think about your power. If you've got plenty of batteries, plenty of solar, and understand during the winter, you may have plenty of solar, but during the winter, you just don't have enough sun to end up pickling those panels very much. So one of the things that I found is that even even what the little device that I have out in the field, that only uses about 250 milliwatts. But I had to step up all the way to a 50 watt solar panel where I could collect enough energy during the winter to keep that system alive. So it, it takes experience and, and a little bit of learning, but yeah, uh, but then, yeah, then, then you, you got get the ideal from that. Have you, have you ever done any of the playing around with the Arduino platform and that kind of stuff? No, I haven't. Although I've got a friend who's trying to get me interested in another project. So I may be delving <laughs> into it. And maybe coming along. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Very interesting. Thanks, Mike. You're, you're very welcome there. Anyway, I thought it was kind of, it's a nice little segue, it, but it's something that we're going to start seeing more of, and they're going to come at us in a lot of different, they're, we're going to see these kind, this kind of product in a lot of different ways because it's so versatile, so powerful. Um, it's really cool the way it works. Okay, guys, I'm done. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Mike. <laughs> thanks, Mike. Mike. Welcome. Is that it, Anthony? Ah, uh, that.